I'm Pastor Danny. If you're new here, it's so good to see you guys here and so glad you're with us this weekend. And I uh, want to say hello to our Femic Island campus. Would you give a Femic Island campus a big hand? <laughs> morning, Femic Island. So glad you're with us this morning. And uh, we had some great worship this morning. And I know Femic Island had great worship as well. And if you're watching online, I want to thank you so much for joining us online. And we're so grateful. Please let us know who you are and send us a note. And we're just so glad that we're all together here this morning. We're in a series called Faith of the Flawed. Now we're going to do this week and then next week is the end of this series. Uh, and we've been looking at the people in the Bible that really messed up, that really blew it, that make big, big mistakes. And I think we can kind of like relate to these people. They, they're like us. There's no halos in the Bible. We talked about David's adultery last week. And someone said, you know, hey, listen, I'm struggling with, with arthritis, not adultery so much. But anyhow, uh, people, you know, in the Bible had problems. Noah got drunk. Uh, and we have uh, Abraham lying. We have all kinds of people in the scriptures that are very, very human. And these people are in the scriptures to encourage us with God's grace, that God is a God of grace, that you can never mess up too bad, that God can't forgive you, that he can't restore you, that he can't work in your life. Uh, and also, we learn from these people things that we can avoid so we don't have to go through the pain that they went through. So today we're going to be looking... At one of my favorite people uh, in the Bible, and it's Jacob. And Jacob deceived his blind father. He deceived his blind father. Now, you know, I don't know, but that's really pretty bad. You know, your father's blind. He goes in and pretends that he's someone else. And the story is found in Genesis chapter 27. And it's such a good story. I want to read a lot of it. So, uh, and then we'll just talk about the implication of this story, what this story teaches us about our life. And so here, here's the deal. Uh, Genesis 27, beginning in verse 1, when Isaac... That was uh, Jacob's father. When Isaac was old and his eyes were weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then get your equipment, your quiver, your bow, and go out into the open country and hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now Rebekah was listening and as Isaac spoke to her son Esau, and Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back. Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can t prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you a blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me and I would appear to be tricking him and he would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing? His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And as she prepared some tasty food, just the way his father liked it, then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which he had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and smooth part of his neck with a goat skin. Then she handed to her son, uh, Jacob, the tasty food and the bread she had made. He went to his father and said, My father, yes, my son, he answered, Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father, Isaac, who touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau, he asked? I am, he replied. Then he said, My son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him, and he ate, and he brought some wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's riches, 
and abundance of grain and new wine and nations to serve you and peoples to bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mothers bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. After Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, my father, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. Trembling violently, he said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me too, my father. He said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he's taken advantage of me. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. They, uh, then he asked, Haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, Esau, I've made him lord over you and made all his relatives his servants, all your relatives his servants, and I've sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? So this is a really, really interesting story, and it has to do with a, sort of a family that had a lot of dysfunction in it. There was a lot of problems in the family. We've got Isaac the father, then his wife, her name is Rebecca. And Rebecca is loves Jacob. That's her favorite son. Uh, Esau uh, is loved by his father Isaac. So you've got favoritism in the family. You got that going on. Uh, you've got a, a husband and wife Isaac and Rebecca who aren't communicating at all. And this is a really convoluted story. But what we find in the story is that Jacob comes and literally deceives his father, pretending to be his brother, to get a blessing from God on him. And that's really, really interesting. And the truth of the matter is, is God did bless Jacob mightily because his father blessed him. So the question is, how can God bless someone that receives a blessing by fraudulent means? How can God bless somebody that deceived his blind father. Now, the blind father is, you know, wanting to bless Esau, the firstborn. In that day, you know, if you were the firstborn son, you received a double inheritance. Uh, in other words, you became, when your father died, you became the leader of the family, and you received twice as much of the inheritance as everybody else. And then upon your father's death, he would lay his hands on you and pray God's prosperity and blessing over you. So we know earlier in the story that uh, Jacob one day was in the camp. He was cooking food, uh, cooking some soup. And his brother Esau comes in, and he comes in, and he's famished from hunting. And he says, I want some of that great soup you're making. And Jacob says to him, I'll be glad to give you some soup, but just give me your birthright first. And it says that Esau said, what good is the birthright to me if I'm starving to death? And so he gave Jacob his birthright and then it says he kind of went on his way without even thinking about it he despised his birthright so this is a really really interesting story Isaac thinks he's blind he thinks he's gonna die and uh, the the irony is that is that Isaac is 137 years old at this point and uh, he thinks he's dying but he's not gonna die he's gonna live 43 more years so he may have been a little bit of a hypochondriac He's kind of like, you know, this is the guy that just is always thinking he's going to die. And so he gives the blessing to Jacob. Now the question is, how can God bless someone that gets a blessing by this type of process? And so the story has something to teach us. And what it teaches us is that God is pleased with Jacob because Jacob has the right desires. God is pleased with Jacob, not because he's perfect, not because he does everything uh, impeccably, but God is pleased with Jacob because of everything in life that he wants, he wants God to bless him. He wants God's blessing. His number one goal in life, his number one passion, his greatest desire, his greatest dream is for God to bless him and for the Lord and his anointing and his presence to be with him. Esau, on the other hand, cares nothing about that. He's not interested in God blessing him. Esau is the typical carnal person. 
All he cares about is having a good time, uh, eating and, and having physical pleasure. He's a carnal man, and he has no desire in the things of God. That is not his goal in life. His goal in life is, is completely physical and carnal. But yet we find in Jacob, this man that's a deceiver, this man who is a manipulator, this man who's a trickster, the one thing about Jacob is Jacob wants the Lord to bless him. He wants the Lord to bless him. Of what he wants in life, the thing he wants more than anything is for the Holy Spirit's presence to be with him. He wants to be close to God. He wants to be anointed by God. He wants to be used by God. His number one objective in life and his hunger in life is for God to bless him. So that's why God blesses Jacob. God blesses Jacob not because he's perfect. God blesses Jacob because he wanted what he should want. He wanted God to bless him. He wanted the Lord to anoint him. He desired for that. The Bible says, Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I want you to think about this today. What is your number one dream in life? What is your number one objective in life? For some of us, our number one objective in life is to, is to lose weight and to look good. If I'm completely honest, a lot of people in our culture want to look good. I'm trying to lose some weight right now. And I have to tell you, I'm not trying to lose weight because, you know, I want to be healthier. I want to look better. I want to look better. When I'm wearing a T-shirt, it looks like I need to wear a bazier. I don't know what's going on here. So, you know, a lot of people in our culture, their big goal is they just want to look good. They are like Esau. They're totally carnalistic in their thinking. Their number one goal is to go to the gym and, and look good and all that. And you should go to the gym. You should take care of your heart. You should look good. You should try to be healthy. That's all good. But if that's your number one passion in life is to look good, to, you know, to live in the Kardashian kind of worldview, then that's really not the right objective in life. Some people want to like make a lot of money. They want to really be. Uh, they want to be successful financially, and that's an incredible thing. The Bible says, if you don't take care of your family, you're worse than an infidel. You need to take care of your family. You need to have resources. You need to be very prudent about your money. You need to work hard. You need to make good investments, and that's so so very important. But if that's your primary objective in life, if your primary objective in life is to make money and get rich and to like be really financially successful, if that really is your greatest dream in life, that you are an Esau, you're living like Esau, you're not living like Jacob. In over 40 years of pastoring here, I can tell you, I've seen person after person after person that becomes obsessed with, I'm going to be wealthy, I'm going to be rich. We live in a very affluent community. Uh, there's parts of this community that are incredibly affluent. And sometimes we can get captivated by that spirit that our number one goal in life is to make a lot of money. Sometimes we want to, you know, be in a situation, our big dream in life is to, is to be successful so that we don't have to do anything, so we can be completely retired and, and all of that. That's a good thing to, you know, be secure financially and all that. But sometimes some people's big goal in life is I don't want to do anything. Heard once about the, uh, the crow that was on the pole and the crow was sitting on the pole, and a rabbit uh, kind of hopped by, and the rabbit said to the crow, what are you doing up there? And the crow said, I'm doing absolutely nothing. And the rabbit said to the crow, can I do absolutely nothing? The crow said, I guess you can do absolutely nothing. And so the rabbit sat there and did absolutely nothing. And then a fox came by and ate the rabbit. And the moral of that story is you can do absolutely nothing, but you got to be pretty far, far up there. So sometimes our goal in life is to do that. Sometimes our, our goals are like Esau's goals. Carnalistic living, thinking about what's best for me, what do I want to do. I want to live for my flesh. And we have no sense of the big eternal picture of us becoming more like Jesus, us becoming more godly. The Bible says that physical exercise profit a little. It's a good thing to exercise. It does have benefit. But godliness 
has value in this life and in the life to come. How many of us that our biggest goal in life is to become more godly, to be more like God, to be more like Jesus, to be transformed into his image? How many of us, when we wake up in the morning, our big passion in life is to become godly and to be more like Jesus? We are living in an Esau generation where everybody is about the carnal, you know, red soup that we're just kind of giving our lives for things that are so tangible and not giving our lives for seeking God's blessing. God bless Jacob because Jacob wanted the blessing of the Lord more than he wanted anything else. And the question we have to ask ourselves in this text is, do we want the Lord? Do we want godliness? Do we want Jesus? Do we want the Lord to bless us? Do we want his presence more than we want anything else in life? I think about, you know, somebody said once that we should hunger for the Lord the way if, you, if someone pushed you under the water and held you under the water and submerged you under the water so you could you know, barely, I mean, you could not, you were you feel, you feel like you're going to drown and you wanted oxygen so bad and they hold you down there until the last moment and then you come out of that water gasping for air because you want that air and you need that air so much. Someone said that that's how we should hunger for the Lord. The Bible says that in Psalm 42.1, David said, as the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you. David's painting a picture of a, of a deer in the forest that's, that's parched with thirst and his tongue is hanging out. The deer's tongue is hanging out. He's so thirsty and he's running through the forest trying to find water to drink. David said, when it comes to my life, David said, I am so hungry for the Lord. I'm so passionate for the Lord. I'm like a deer running through the forest trying to find water. Are you, are you passionate like Jacob? Do you say, I'll do anything to get God's blessing. I'll do anything to get God's presence. I'll spend time with him. I'll read his word. I'll be with his people. I'll do anything to have God's blessing. Are you like Jacob that says, I'll, I'll even lie. I'll steal. I'll deceive. I'll do anything to get the blessing of the Lord. And that's what was great about Jacob. And God blessed Jacob. God blessed Jacob and anointed Jacob. So the Jacob story is about two types of people. It's about a person that says, my big objective in life, my big goal in life, my big passion in life is to get the presence of the Lord. Like Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, he said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. I, everything that I did in the past, I forget those things, and I press on that I may know Jesus. And it, what the word know is there is gnosis, and it means to know Jesus intimately. And the Bible says in James chapter 4, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. If you're like, say, Lord, every day I get up, I'm, I'm drawing near to you. I'm drawing near to you. I want to know you. I want to pursue you. So the difference between Esau and Jacob is, you know, Esau is like, hey, I want to have fun. I want to have a good time. I just want, I want to do a good thing. And every time I see like some husband that's drugged to church by a wife and, and he would rather be, you know, doing something else. He'd rather be, you know, uh, playing tennis or on the golf course or whatever. And he's like there sitting there dutifully so he can keep peace at home. I know I'm looking at an Esau. I'm looking at an Esau because he has no real hunger for God. He doesn't want the blessing of the Lord. But a true Jacob Jacob's going to come to church. Man, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to play tennis or I'm going to play golf or I'm going to go fishing on, on you know, Wednesday or Friday or Saturday. But boy, when people, God's people are gathered together and there's a small group, I'm going to be with them because I want to know Christ. I'm a Jacob. I want the Lord to bless me. So are you an Esau or are you a Jacob? Am I a Jacob or I'm an Esau? You know, me, I'm like... I'm into like academics. I'm into education. I like want to learn. I, you know, the reason is I failed first grade and I've spent the rest of my life trying to overcome that sense of failure. And I'm like, I'm going to get educated. I got two master's degrees. I'm working on a third, a third, our doctorate degree now. And like, I love to learn. I love to learn. And every once in a while, the Lord pats me on the shoulder. He says, Is that your passion? Is that your passion? Your number one passion needs to know me. It doesn't matter how educated you are. If you don't have the burning fire of God inside of you, you have nothing to offer. 
I love people that love God's blessing more than anything else. My dad's 86 years old. He's uh, got a little bit of memory issues, and he's still trying to preach. He doesn't have a lot of energy. My dad, I call him up. I say, Dad, hey, what have you been doing today? Well, I went down to the church and walked around in the church and lifted my hands up. And I prayed, and I spent time with the Lord, and I sought the Lord. And he just loves to pray. Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how big your church is. It doesn't matter how many people look at you on TV. It doesn't matter how big your church is or how great a pastor you are. At the end of the day, a great pastor is someone that has a hunger for God and loves God and wants to seek the Lord. And we need to have pastors in America. I don't care how big your church is, how small it is. I don't care how fancy it is. We need pastors in America that have a hunger for God and seek God with all their heart. Can you say a big amen? When our boys were growing up, we sent our, our kids to, uh, at junior high, we sent them to a little Christian school not too far from here. And, uh, and I remembered my son, Tim. Tim was, uh, when he was young, uh, he, was, he was just a little heavy. He was a little heavy. And uh, he was just a sweet kid, very talented kid. Uh, but, you know, he was just a little heavy. And when he went to that Christian school, he wanted to be on the basketball team. He wanted to be on the basketball team, and they had like a JV, and you could go out for that when you were in seventh grade. And so Tim signed up to go uh, to try out for the JV basketball team. And I'd go pick him up, and his little, little guy at that point, a little, little heavy, all the team had finished running their laps. And I'd get there, and the team is leaving, and Tim's still running his laps. He's still running his laps because it's taking him longer. And everybody's gone. He's the last one. I'm sitting on the bleachers, me and the coach, and Tim is finishing his laps. Every time I picked him up, he's the last one. Everybody else is leaving. He's, he's finishing those laps. And at home, he started quitting eating cookies and got really serious about his diet, and he's exercising. And I'll never forget, I'll be forever thankful to Jim Berger, the coach, who put Tim on that team. And he made the team, and he started playing, and he played every year. And I remember sitting in the stands at his senior game, his last game, and he's tall, and he's handsome at this point, and he's thin, and he's playing center, and they're playing some arch rival for the team. And if I remember it correctly, Tim rebounded and scored the last basket of the game. And I just sat there, and I was thinking, oh, boy, the last game I'll ever get to see him play. But you know what I thought? I thought about, I thought about that little boy that's heavy, that little boy that, that was out of shape, that little boy that was overweight, running around, the, running around the gym, running around the gym behind everybody. He wanted it so bad, he was going to do anything to make that team. He was, he was diligent to make that team. And I, I just think that when it comes to following the Lord, how many of us are saying, Lord... I'll do whatever it takes to be close to you. I'll do whatever it takes to become a woman of God. I'll do whatever it takes to become a man of God. I'll do whatever it takes to become a godly person. I'll do whatever it takes to walk in your presence in such a way that people that I work with will notice that I've been with the Lord. I'll do anything. And that's what was Jacob's deal. Jacob says, I'll do anything. I'll do anything for the Lord to bless me. And God blessed him. You look at chapter 32 of Genesis, Jacob has to leave town after he deceived his brother because his brother felt inspired to kill him. And so Jacob's gone for 20 years and he's coming back. And as he comes back to Canaan, he's been gone for 20 years and he's prospered. God has fulfilled that word that his father gave him. He's got flocks and herds. Everything he touches turns to gold. He's being blessed and he's coming back to the land. And Esau hears he's coming. And Esau's coming with 400 men. And I don't think he's coming to give him a high five. I think he's coming to kill him. And so Jacob is so interesting. He divides his flocks. He he gets some little groups of flocks to send to Esau's gifts. Jacob is very practical. But then he spends the night on the other side of the Jabbok River. And he's, he's wrestling with the Lord. He's seeking the Lord. He's hanging on to the Lord. And, and, and he's wrestling with a man until daybreak, it says. And here's what Jacob said. I will not let you go until you bless me. I won't let you go until you bless me. And God's trying to get away and Jacob's got a hold of him. and says, I won't let you go until you bless me. 
And then God said, Jacob, what's your name? He didn't say, Jacob, what's your name? He said, what's your name? And he said, I'm Jacob. He said, no longer will you be named Jacob, but you will be named Israel because you struggled with men and with God and you prevailed. And he came out of that experience walking with a limp. He was walking with God's presence. And when Esau saw him, Esau ran, didn't run to kill him. Esau ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. See, God's blessing was on Jacob because he wanted his blessing more than he wanted anything else. And I don't know, I don't know in this audience today, I don't know in the audiences across America, I don't know how many people have a Jacob spirit. I don't know how many people in America say, God, I want you to bless me. I want you to help me no matter what. I'll do anything to have your blessing. I think we're just kind of going through the motions sometimes. And I think God wants to raise up churches all across America, all across Delmarva, with people that say, listen, I will do anything to get the Lord to bless me. D.L. Moody was a famous evangelist. And D.L. Moody was sitting in a service one time and he heard this guy named Varley. He was an evangelist and he was a British evangelist. D.L. Moody, of course, was a, uh, sold shoes in America and became an evangelist in the 1800s. And he's sitting in Dublin, Ireland, and he hears, he hears this, this evangelist named Varley was his last name. I can't remember his first name. But this evangelist said, the world is yet to see The world is yet to see a man totally consecrated to the Lord. And D.L. Moody, sitting in that audience that day, said, I will be that man. I will be that man. I will be totally consecrated to the Lord. I'll be totally dedicated to the Lord. My main dream in life will be to walk in his presence and to know him. Starting in November here, we're going to start on Monday mornings. Those of you that are retired or your schedule works out at 7 o'clock on Monday morning, starting on November 7th, we're going to be meeting in the foyer, praying for all the needs that came in on Sunday morning and seeking the Lord, how to develop our intimacy with the Lord. I'll be leading that group. starts on November 7th. It's called the prayer team on the kiosk. But if you're not a part of that, wherever you are, are you seeking the Lord? With all your heart. Jeremiah said, if you'll find me if you seek me with all your heart. You'll find me if you seek me with all your heart. This week I was uh, spending some time with the Lord. And, you know, I study a lot and administrate things I do, which I love. I love my job. absolutely love what I do. I hope I get to do forever. I love what I do. But the Lord just said, you know, you used to lay on, you used to lay on your face before me. You used to lay on your face and seek my face. When you were in Bible college, you used to lay on the ground and seek me. And I have these little prayers now I pray, and I go walking, and I pray when I'm walking. I listen to a a sermon by Tim Keller on the first part of the walk, and I pray on the way back. That's what I do every day. And I'm praying, and the Lord just called me to get on my face and lay on that carpet. And I'm telling you what, I had a, I had a, a, a memory flash of what it used to be like to seek the Lord with all my heart. Jacob said, doesn't matter. I'll put on animal skins. I'll go in and I'll risk a curse. If I can get God to bless me, I'll do anything. And it's just the means were so distorted. Who knows what would have happened if he hadn't done that? You know, he had, his mother had been promised when uh, he was born that he would be the one that would be favored and blessed. But he went in, he wanted God's blessing. It's the reason, the reason that God blessed Jacob, even though he deceived his father, was because he wanted the blessing more than anything else. And Esau didn't care. Esau didn't care. Esau just wanted to have a good time. Esau just wanted, the birthright to him was worth a bowl of soup. And he just wanted to feed his carnal flesh. So we have to think about that. When Karen and I were in Bible college, um, 
I was, uh, you know, we, we were going through school and didn't have a lot of money. And so I remember when on the weekends, our dates had to be pretty creative. So we usually ride to the beach, Johnson's Beach or Pensacola Beach and walk on the beach and collect shells or something. And one night we're riding uh, on a road on the way to Johnson's Beach, which is not too far from Pensacola. And we rode by a, a, a dog track. And there was a dog track there, and some of you have heard me tell this story before, and uh, I thought, you know, I'd never seen a dog race before, and those greyhound things, and so we, we got out of the car and went up there to chain link fence. We knew it was gambling, but, we, you know, we didn't have any money to gamble. We thought, yeah, we didn't think we'd go to hell for this, but we were up there anyhow, <laughs> and we're watching those dogs, and you know, there's an electronic rabbit that runs around, and those dogs, they, they put them in little, like, little cages, and the bell goes off, and the electronic rabbits, and they chase that rabbit because it's got a scent. And so we just watching that. This is like, they didn't have that in Sussex County where we came from. That was really interesting. So I said to Karen, let's pick a dog and let's, let's pick a dog. And that'll be our dog. Of course, we're just pretending, but we're going to pick that dog. We're going to put our money on, on number seven over here. So number seven, the little greyhound came out there and we're going to put her, put her number on number seven, you know? So the bell rang and all those greyhounds start running with all their might and they're running. And when our dog got to the corner, all the other dogs took the corner and our dog kept going straight on. I mean, he ended up in Alabama somewhere. (laughs) I don't know what that dog was chasing, but he was chasing something different than everybody else was chasing. And are you chasing what everybody else is chasing? Are you chasing just being educated, being wealthy, being successful, being free to do nothing? Are you chasing the Kardashian dream to look great? What are you chasing? I want to chase something that nobody else is chasing. I want to chase something that most people aren't pursuing in their lives. I want to be, I want to be a man who knows the presence of God in a way that no one else seems to know. I want to be a part of a people. I want to be a part of a group of people that say, the most important thing in my life is Jesus. The most important thing in my life has become more righteous and more holy like him. The most important thing in my life is to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Let's not be a generation that chases what everybody else is chasing. But as the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you. Would you lift your hands to Jesus right now? If you're an Esau, if you're an Esau living for your golf game, your tennis game, your fishing boat, your bass boat, that's good. All that stuff is great. That's part of your life. God's given that to you to bless you. But that's, that's, that, that stuff bows at the feet of Jesus. It's not why you live. You live for him. You live for him. We have been bought with the price, the precious blood of Jesus, and we are not our own. We belong to him. Now, Father, as we lift our hands this day, we thank you that you are awakening your church, that you're awakening us, that we would know you in a deeper way. I thank you for people that are going to begin to pray this fall, that you're going to begin to raise up prayer warriors in our church. We're going to begin to raise up people that are part of small groups that are seeking you. You're going to raise up people that in their daily walks with you, Lord, their day is going to be situated around you. They're going to find a place in their prayer closet. They're going to get on their knees and they're going to lay on their face before you in their office and they're going to seek you. Lord, they're going to, they're going to turn the radio off when they're riding down the road and they're going to begin to cry out to God. They're going to begin to sing worship songs to you and worship you. God, we want to run after you. We want to seek you with all of our heart. I speak your blessing on our church, and we thank you for your love and your grace for us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen. If you love the Lord, say a big amen. Let's celebrate how great the Lord is. Would you celebrate with me this morning? (laughs) Hallelujah. I love you guys dearly, and I'm so excited about this fall.
Uh, I wanted to say something before Corey comes to close us out. November 18th is our uh, Thanksgiving banquet. And I have a good friend, a guy named David Mayo, that's coming from, uh, from Florida to speak. When he was 16 years old, he had a... Uh, he was mountain climbing and fell and broke his back. He's, in, he's been in a wheelchair his whole life. He's uh, in, in his 50s now. He's a very successful businessman, uh, owns TV stations, and just a very inspirational guy. He will be here on November 18th. So sign up for the, Chris, for the uh, Thanksgiving banquet. It's called Friendsgiving. You can go today to sign up for it. And that night we'll be launching giving to people for Christmas. We're going to be helping 75 uh, children over in the Seaford School District area this year, 75 people, and a, a wonderful friend of mine that goes to our, um, our, our Rehoboth campus, uh, Tish Pusey, it has MS. She's been in, she was former Miss Delaware. She's been, she's bedridden now, has no way of making income, and it's Bayshore's dream at this banquet to, to raise money for Christmas to help her to pay her mortgage for six months to a year. So that's all going to be happening on November 18th. So make sure today when you leave, you know, there's four kiosks out there. Go ahead and sign up for that and get a big jump on that. Let us know you're coming.